chapter three. Hopefully by now you've got the hang of where to find Habakkuk in your Bibles. The easiest way is to go to Matthew's Gospel at the beginning of the New Testament and then work backwards five books to the short little book of Habakkuk. And we are going to be looking at Habakkuk chapter three this morning, the last chapter of Habakkuk. And I sent out a little introductory video that looked at the first two verses. So I'm not gonna mention the first two verses this morning. I'll look at the rest of the chapter and you can look at the video on YouTube uh, for those verses. So let me just give you a very short reminder of Habakkuk. Habakkuk was a prophet writing about 600 years before Christ. He was writing into a situation where in the, in the kingdom of Judah, which was being ruled by a bad king, where there was a lot of injustice and corruption and people were not um, honoring God in their lives. And Habakkuk was speaking into that situation. And one of the things that God showed him was that the Babylonians were going to come and uh, be the instrument of God's justice, which was a shock and not a pleasant uh, answer to Habakkuk's prayers. But here in Habakkuk chapter three, we are listening in to a prayer between um, a conversation, obviously, as prayers are between us and God. And the way the chapter's structured, uh, if you've read it, you, you might have noticed this, that uh, verses three to seven, Habakkuk talks about God in the third person. He talks about God as he. He's not directly talking to God, although I suspect it's still a prayer. But sometimes even when we're praying or even when we're worshipping God, we talk about him in the third person, don't we? I think of some of the Psalms, perhaps one of the best known Psalms, 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all my inmost being praise his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, diseases redeems your life from the pit, and so on. We talk about God in the third person in a lot of our hymns, but we're still praying to him. We're still worshipping him, and that's what happens in verses 3 to 7. And then in verses 8 to 12, sorry, 8 to 15, God address, sorry, Habakkuk addresses God directly. He calls him you. He speaks to God, uh, to his face, as it were. It's slightly more direct language. And then just in the last few verses, 16 to 19, he, he's talk, he, the language is of I. He talks about himself and he expresses himself in terms of how he's feeling and about what he feels God is calling him to do. So I'm going to use that structure in this, uh, in this short talk just to, to help us give a bit of structure to ourselves as we look at Habakkuk chapter 3. So uh, firstly, therefore, we'll look at verses 3 to 7, which is talking to God in a sense about who God is. Uh, just share my screen for a minute. There you go. Talking to myself about God is what I've called this. Do you often talk to yourself? Is prayer for you a way of talking to yourself about God? Uh, and you might think, well, that's that's slightly odd. You know, pr prayer is not talking to myself. But as I've said, actually, there are examples in Scripture and in the hymns we sing where we are, where we talk to ourselves and we remind ourselves what God is like. So let me read you these verses. Habakkuk 3, 3 to 7. God came from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens and his praise filled the earth. His splendor was like the sunrise. Rays flashed from his hand where his power was hidden. Plague went before him. Pestilence followed his steps. He stood and shook the earth. He looked and made the nations tremble. The ancient mountains crumbled and the age old hills collapsed, but he marches on forever. I saw the tents of Cushan in disgrace, the dwellings of Midian in anguish. It's a piece of poetry and it's strongly evocative in the language that Habakkuk is using of the Exodus. You see references to God's power, uh, to plagues, uh, to his appearances at uh, Mount Sinai with the flashing lightning and the this awesome way that God appeared to his people as they were traveling through the desert and that's the kind of language that Habakkuk is using when he talks to himself about what God is like and prayer one of the features of prayer is that it is reminding ourselves what God is like who God is like and what he does uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones used to say that we need to get into, we need to cultivate the habit 
of talking to ourselves, not listening to ourselves. Now, what did he mean by that? He meant it's very easy to become overwhelmed by our feelings. It's very, it's very easy for our relationship with God, our spirituality, to be determined by what side of bed we got out on or the kind of things that are happening to us. And I think this is a theme that we've noticed in the book of Habakkuk. True spirituality means recognizing our feelings and the circumstances in which we're living, but not being defined by them. And true prayer is therefore acknowledging our feelings but not letting those be the dominant thing and actually talking to ourselves and reminding ourselves not about who we are and how we're feeling but about what God's like and what he's done and that's what Habakkuk's doing in these verses he is speaking truth to himself about the kind of God he knows that he's worshipping like like Job Habakkuk has been asking the question why why is all this stuff happening to me? But the answer he gets, the answer he presents to himself is to, is to ask the question, who? Who is it all about? Do you remember at the, at the end of the book of Job, the long, long book of Job, in contrast to this short little book of Habakkuk, where Job and his friends have been going backwards and forwards, and Job eventually gets to talk to God himself. And God doesn't give Job the answer to his question. He doesn't give himself the, the answer to the question why. He gives himself the he gives him the answer to the question who. He reveals what God is like, and Job is just overwhelmed he's dumbstruck he puts his hand over his mouth he is awestruck at who God is and that's what good prayer leads us to it reminds us of what God is like and so Habakkuk is here reminding himself of what God has done for his people in the Bible especially in the Old Testament we see what God is like by the things he does and so Habakkuk is reminding himself of God's awesome power, his awesome works of deliverance in the past. He's reminding himself that if God can bring us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, then he can certainly deliver us from the Babylonians, because God is an awesome God, a powerful God, and he is over all things, over the plagues and the pestilences and the pandemics. He is over them all. He is a God who's wor worthy to be worshipped. So my question to you this morning is, what do you need to be telling yourself about God? What do you need to be telling yourself about God, reminding yourself about God? What, when you're talking to God, what do you need to be talking to yourself about? And Habakkuk gives us some pointers in these verses. His glory, his splendor, his power are the kind of things that Habakkuk's been talking to God about. Well, let's move on to verses 8 to 15. And here, as I said before, Habakkuk is talking to God now, and he's still talking about God. He's still talking about what God's like, but he's addressing God directly. So here we are, verses 8 to 15. Were you angry with the rivers, Lord? He's still talking about the Exodus, by the way, and the crossing the Red Sea and everything else. He's still using that kind of language. Were you angry with the rivers, Lord? Was your wrath against the streams? Did you rage against the sea when you rode your horses and your chariots to victory? You uncovered your bow. You called for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. Torrents of water swept by. The deep roared and lifted its waves on high. Sun and moon stood still in the heavens at the glint of your flying arrows, at the lightning of your flashing spear. In wrath you strode through the earth and in anger you threshed the nations. You came out to deliver your people, to save your anointed one. You crushed the leaders of the land of wickedness. You stripped him from head to foot. With his own spear, you pierced his head when his warriors stormed out to scatter us, gloating as though about to devour the wretched who were in hiding. You trampled the sea with your horses, churning the great waters. Talking to God about God and the things he's done. And I said these, these, la this language evokes Exodus, but actually there's language in those verses that evokes God's work of creation. 
and other things that we see in the New Testament. People have seen echoes of, um, of Noah and the flood, um, but the, 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 the experts say that the Hebrew words that uh, Habakkuk is using would have been particularly evocative of the Exodus experience and the people being led through the wilderness and into the promised land over the Red Three Sea, over the Jordan, conquering armies and so on, the sun standing still on occasions and these things. So Joke, Habakkuk is evoking these memories of Israel about how God had delivered them in the past. But there is some language in these verses that we might find troubling uh, because there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of words of, of violence and there's repeated reference to God's wrath and his anger. Um, in verse 8 particularly, were you angry with the rivers, Lord? Was your wrath against the streams? Did you rage against the sea when you rode your horses and your chariots to victory? And Habakkuk seems to be having a conversation with God about which he's saying, God, is this really the kind of God you're like? And yet, as he reminds himself of these experiences of Israel's history, the answer is at least in part, yes, that is what God is like. Uh, people who don't know much about the Christian faith and certainly haven't read their Bibles very well tend to have this image that the Old Testament is all about an angry, violent God and the New Testament is about a, a very gentle, meek and mild sort of God who comes to us in the manger and never says boo to a goose. And, and you don't have to certainly read the New Testament for very long before you realise that that's a, um, certainly not an accurate portrayal of, of the Bible. Uh, Jesus said in John chapter 3, we all know the very famous verse in John chapter 3, but here's another verse um, just slightly later. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. God's wrath or anger remains on those who reject the Son. Those words there in John 3 on the lips of Jesus. And Jesus was not afraid of using language about God's wrath and anger. And so when we talk to God and we learn to engage with God about what he's like, one of the things we have to explore is the fact that we don't come to God as someone who, who is just a, a reflection of us and of our preferences for who he's like. We don't, when we come to God in prayer, we're not trying to look in a mirror and just seeing a reflection of our own desire for a, a God that's made in the image of us and our culture and so on. We see, we go to God in prayer to find out more about him and to learn that God is a God who gets extremely angry when people um, practice injustice, when people uh, rebel against him, when people worship idols, when people do not live the kind of way that he wants them to live, and especially when they reject him. But we also get a glimpse in these verses of some other language about God. It's perhaps not as clear to us as it might have been to the original hearers, but in, in verse 8 we get the first reference to salvation, because the word that NIV translates victory is the is the, is the same Hebrew word from which the name Jesus is derived. It's the Joshua, the Yeshua word. It's the saving word. It's the, it's the delivering, um, bringing out of darkness into light word. When you rode your horses in all this anger against injustice, you're, and you, you rode your chariots to victory, to deliverance, you were taking us out of oppression into deliverance, into the promised land. And we meet that word again twice in verse 13. You came out to deliver to Jesus your people, we might say, sort of anglicizing the language. You came out to deliver your people, to save to Jesus your anointed one. I, I say that word respectfully because I'm, that is the Hebrew word that Habakkuk was using from which we get the, the name Jesus, which is an anglicized pronunciation of, of Joshua or Yeshua. And it's that word that Habakkuk is using in amidst all this language of wrath against sin is this language of deliverance. This language that we as Christians look back on and we see, yes, we see in here a, a foretaste of the one who's going to ultimately come and deliver us from injustice and oppression, including the oppression and injustice that's deep within our hearts. And there's that word, the anointed one, there in verse 13, which was probably primarily a reference in Habakkuk's mind to Israel as a whole, God's chosen people. 
But of course, that, that is the word that in, in, in the Greek New Testament is translated Christ. It's the Messiah word. You, you, you came out to, to Jesus, your people, to save your Christed one. If you, if you get the language, you see what's going on here. These are words that, that Habakkuk, I'm sure, would have no idea what, that he was, he was in a sense pointing forward. But we as Christians, we read these verses and we see the language that Jesus and the early church used. Um, the, the names that were given to Jesus himself are picking up these concepts of deliverance about someone being anointed to bring forth the people out of darkness into light. So there was that are Christians that should warm our hearts and remind us that this angry, wrathful God is also a God who is on our side, who wants to save and deliver us. So my question to you as... Um, as, as we think about how Habakkuk was addressing God here, talking to God about God, how would it help you to spend some time talking to God today about what he's like, about his character as revealed in the Bible? Is the kind of God that you're addressing actually the, the whole picture? Or are we, are we a bit selective? And like Habakkuk, perhaps we need to wrestle a bit with some of the aspects of God's character that we don't find so easy to relate to, but also to remind us that above all, he is the one who revealed himself in Jesus Christ as the saviour, the one who came to bring deliverance. So up to now in this chapter, in a sense, Habakkuk is having, he's having the curtain pulled back on him as he engages God, as he talks to God about what God's like, He's realizing the answer to his prayer that he he asks right back in chapter one. Do you remember how, how Habakkuk starts this prophecy? He starts by saying, why, God? How long, God? What's it all about? Why and what are you doing? And the answer he's getting, like the book of Job, like others who wrestle with God, the answer he gets is to say, look at what, what look at what God's like. Job, Job and Habakkuk, look at what I'm like. Focus on me. Focus not on your circumstances and your feelings, but, but think about what I'm like and what I've done in history and what I'm going to do in the future. And, and use that to speak into your feelings and your circumstances, to encourage you, but also to challenge you. Now we move on and um, Habakkuk ends in a, in a good place, I'm pleased to say, and we get some of the most beautiful verses in this book. And I've, I've called this talking to others about my conversation with God, because the feeling you get is that Habakkuk's been having this conversation with God. And then in verses 16 to 19, he's, these are, this is his word of testimony. This is what he's going out to say to the people that he's prophesying to, to his front line, if you like. These, this is his conclusion in the matter. L listen to me as I read verses 16 to 19. I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Is, is that your testimony when you spent time with God? This, this, in a sense, was Habakkuk's testimony. He went out to his friends and neighbours and he said, I've been spending time with God. And frankly, I was overwhelmed. It was, it was awesome in the, mo in the most profound sense of the word. I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Yet... I waited patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. I spent time with God and God gave me peace and patience. And then we get these wonderful verses, 17 and 18. And it's important that we don't underestimate. So most of us live in, you know, we live in towns or even if we live in the countryside, we're not, we're not really reliant on our produce. I mean, there may be one or two of you who are who are farmers or who live off the land. Uh, I, I remember I spent um, quite a few years now, I spent a year in a, a part of Africa, which was very, very rural. There was no water or electricity. Everybody was just living off their, their little small holdings, their shambles. And if it didn't rain, if the, if the weather wasn't right, it was absolutely devastating. I, I was trying to teach in a school, a secondary school, and we had those tin corrugated sheets on the roof. And when it rained, it was so loud, you, you had to stop teaching. Uh, but it was fine because when it rained, the children were so happy. 
I know we're looking all looking out thinking, oh, it's raining again. But for them, when it rained, that meant literally that they weren't going to go hungry this year. Now, that's the kind of context that Habakkuk is speaking into here in verses 17, where he said, because the Babylonians are coming and they're going to strip the place bare, there's not going to be any food. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the sheep's fold and no cattle in the stalls, just pause there. This is an absolute calamity. We are going to not have anything to eat. The crops have failed, the sheep have been stolen, and we have nothing left. And what's Habakkuk's response? Having spent time with God. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. Habakkuk says, my, my whole perspective has been changed in a quite extraordinary, and we can only say miraculous way. So Habakkuk is being honest. He's being honest, I think, with his friends and neighbours about how, he, how it feels to encounter God there in verse 16 prayer for him was not a was not an easy thing it was not just a you know a quick chat with God and being given some comforting words it was a it was a awe-inspiring moment that he'd spent in God's presence and I suppose the challenge to us is you know where is our deep sense of the glory and majesty of God when we spend time with him our awareness of our, our utter unworthiness as we stand before him, our overwhelming gratitude that we have been saved and delivered and adopted, and our desire to communicate this, to speak this out to our friends and neighbours and those on our front lines, like Habakkuk did there in verse 16. But in verses 17 and 18 and 19, we see that Habak we see Habakkuk showing an intentionality in his prayer life. You see, there's a difference, isn't there, between um, feeling happy and rejoicing. Feeling happy is something that comes from within us, and it's not particularly something we can control. It's, it's to do with our circumstances, it's to do with our temperament, it's to do with what side of bed we got out on, it's to do with, you know, chemicals rushing around in our brains, and it's, it's not something that's easy to control. Some of us might be better at it than others, and perhaps sometimes, somehow we learn to... Um, to, to, to be able to control it a bit. But actually, happiness is not something, the Bible never says be happy. You know, that, that's just a, a stupid thing to say to somebody, isn't it, who's miserable, oh, you know, be happy. But what the Bible repeatedly tells us to do, and it sometimes also feels a bit insensitive, but repeatedly says rejoice. And re rejoice, therefore, is not about how we feel, it's about something we choose to do. We choose in the midst of even the crops failing and our sheep and cattle being stolen, we choose even in those circumstances to look up and say, God, I'm, I'm overwhelmed. I don't know how I'm going to deal with this situation. I don't understand why this is happening. And yet, and yet I choose to worship you. I choose to place my joy in you. And I decide to give you thanks and to give you honour despite what's going on. I will rejoice in the Lord, that personal word for God. I will be joyful in God, my saviour. That's the, that's the Jesus word again, my deliverer, my salvation. I, despite all this happening, yes, I will. I decide as a matter of my will that I am going to rejoice in you. I'm going to be in, rejoice in God, the one who delivers me. And he testifies finally in verse 19. He testifies that God is the one who gives him strength, who enables him to say this. See, Habakkuk's been on a journey, hasn't he, from chapter 1, verse 2, where it was all about why and how long and God, why, when are you going to come and deal with this? And by the end of it, Habakkuk has been given strength through a, a difficult and challenging series of conversations with God. He's been given the strength to actually decide to rejoice. And as he puts it, 
to, to tread on the heights, to walk up the mountain, to keep going, to persevere. May God enable us to tread the heights as we wrestle with him in prayer. And may he enable us to talk to others about these conversations that we're having with God, these difficult conversations, these conversations that we find challenging. Let's have the courage to tell others about what it's like to speak to a God who is so holy and awesome and yet so loving and caring. Let's be intentional in our conversations with God. Let's ask him to help us to find our joy in him. And let's trust that he will give us the strength. So, brothers and sisters, that is the book of Habakkuk, and I hope it's been a blessing to you, but I hope not just in a sort of a sort of purely comforting sense, but also a challenge to us that we will be also be willing to inhabit Habakkuk's words and his prayers to take our senses of frustration and um, impatience to God and to find that as we engage with God and as God reveals more of himself to us, then it, he transforms our perspective. He takes it all from being about us and about well, when is all this going to get better? And he focuses our minds on him and what he, the kind of God he's like, what he's already done, what he's going to do, and especially in the Lord Jesus, who is, though Habakkuk did not see it, but we see it in Habakkuk's words. He is the answer, the deliverance, the salvation, the hope, to all our deepest longings and desires. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for this little book of Habakkuk, written by this man who we know nothing else about, but we thank you for the depth of his relationship with you, of his spirituality, and we pray that you will help us to go deeper with you, to engage with you, to reflect more on who you are, what you're really like, and your great purposes for us. Lord, take us deeper, take us forward, and help us to, to bear witness to what you're doing in our lives as we speak those around, to those around us who don't yet have this hope themselves. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.